Good evening. This evening, we are very pleased and honored to have a conversation uh, and to get to know Crystal Paco San Augustine, Director of Communications uh, of the Office of the Governor of Guam. I'm accompanied by my coworker, Dong Cho, who is our new Guam field representative for the Office of Insular Affairs on Guam. And we have our communications intern, Philippe Izedian, uh, who is a sophomore at Duke University and also assisting and joining us this evening. So without any further ado, Crystal, welcome to our conversation. Thank you for agreeing to, to join us. And um, please tell us a little bit about what you do now uh, for the, the governor of Guam. Well, half a day. My name is Crystal Paco San Augustine. I'm the Director of Communications at the Office of the Governor of Guam. You just got promoted to um, Director of Communications. Were you, and you were hired as the Press Secretary first? Yes. Yes, I was hired as the Press Secretary for the Leon Guerrero Tenor Administration. And just recently, about two months ago, I was promoted to the Director of Communications. In this capacity, I'm really in charge at the forefront, rather, of all the messaging that comes out of our office and all of our agencies that fall under the umbrella. It's a very daunting task of lots and lots of work, especially with social media being you know, the predominant way most people consume, consume their news, consume information, and trying to yeah. make effective messaging that people not only like, but want to share. And so using social media has definitely yeah. been one of the major, major parts of, of my job, uh, creating videos, is a bigger thing more than ever, although we still have our traditional media consumers, those who like to physically touch a newspaper uh, we, and watch TV and see the commercials. We are seeing you know, more podcasts, more radio talk shows that are more interactive on Facebook, uh, more people on YouTube and, and social media like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and you know, trying to adopt all these different technologies, these different platforms and get our message across, especially because COVID is not just something, COVID-19 is not just something we have to communicate to a certain, a target group. COVID-19 is something we have to communicate to the whole public, especially as we work towards our response to continue to make progress in, in declining our numbers, our positive case count. I'm sure you're tracking Guam is, has, you know, seen a spike in a, Starting in August, we saw our second wave, and we saw majority of our deaths in the last few last few months. Now we're at a, up to 112 deaths and over 6,000 cases for our very small community. So trying to communicate, to make messaging that people will buy into, that they'll want to be a part of, especially as we battle COVID fatigue. So we really want to, yeah. you know. Get the message out there. What are the new restrictions? What's the new protocol and the guidance? You know, are we locking down? Are we not locking down? And how do you get people to buy into to our effort? You know, to wear your mask, watch your distance, wash your hands, and have the willpower to do so. So we have to get really creative. And again, we're also battling not just COVID fatigue, but attention spans and so much messaging and noise coming at people. So trying to get messaging that works, that's effective, that sticks with somebody, that builds empathy, and that builds trust in government has, has definitely been challenging. And so that's really my priority. And so, you know, not, are we only, not only are we dealing with COVID-19, but you know, there are other things in government that still have to happen. Government operations still have to happen. People need to get their license, the driver's license. They need to get their, their health certificates. They need to go to work. They need to get licensing for their Americans. They need to buy homes. So government still operates despite COVID-19. And so also balancing that of the safety and the health of our people has been really challenging. Do you have a team? I have a very small team. <laughs> it's myself, uh, again, the director of communications. And I like to call them my creatives. Uh, they have, I have one graphic artist, I, as you know, visual people are very visual learner. A lot of us are visual learners, myself included. I have two videographers. They are great storytellers. I also work very closely with policy. Our policy uh, advisor is very critical to my, it's helping me write. Uh, there's just so much things that we have to write, a lot of letter writing. There's so much we have to do all the time. So a very intimate team, only a handful of us, but I think we make it work. Uh, we do our best to again, create impactful messaging and, and to get the, the, the platform for, of Governor Lilian Guerrero and, and Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio across the people. Can you talk a little bit more about other priorities of the governor uh, in addition to COVID that you might have to, to communicate? Uh, you know, Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio has really 
really been focused on, you know, addressing our homeless population. And so that's one of the his strongest initiatives right now, especially during COVID, which has only highlighted a lot of the shortcomings of government that have accumulated over the, over the decades. And so trying to establish a homeless shelter, which he did, uh, over about 70 to 90 people are, are occupy that shelter. And most of, a lot of them, over a dozen of those individuals are children and some of them are infants. And so, you know, again, COVID-19 is not the only thing, but it definitely highlights any of the shortcomings or any of the problems that were already existing. And so homeless is addressing our homelessness, you know, providing wraparound services, you know, because it's not just providing a roof over your head, it's providing, you know, what, what is causing homelessness? Is it, is it mental illness? Is it inability to get proper paperwork? Is it, is it family issues, especially in a small community like Guam, where we really care for one another, we have a strong uh, connection with one another and to see people homeless on the streets, especially, you know, with COVID and and more people losing jobs or their wages are impacted. So, you know, trying to keep people from becoming homeless and trying to help those who are ready without adequate shelter. And uh, right now also we're in the middle of rainy season and we're actually on Typhoon Row. Uh, if you're familiar with Guam and our location, we are very susceptible to typhoons and super typhoons. And so we're in that, that time of year where we have to be careful. And so trying to communicate uh, how to be safe, and how to prepare our public, our community in the event of a typhoon during a COVID environment. You know, it's not as simple as just going to a school gym for shelter anymore. It's about, you know, properly uh, distancing, uh, you know, being, uh, addressing all the sanit sanitization needs and, in, and ensuring we are able to keep everyone safe and not cause an outbreak or spread it in, in these vulnerable communities. So homelessness is a, is a big thing. Do you find, Crystal, um, any one particular media platform that you use more than the other? We really love WhatsApp. Uh, you know, oh. there's nothing faster than the Chamorro News Network. And I think Don can attest to this, is that, you know, word of mouth, living on a small island, you know, communication is really when you hear what you hear through the grapevine, what you hear from the Chamorro News Network, you know, what your auntie told you, what is being shared on WhatsApp. And so WhatsApp has been the most amazing vehicle for getting information out and getting it out fast. But the same note, it's also been the place where, you know, poor messaging goes out or misinformation is spread. And so what I do as the head of the Joint Information Center for our emergency response is that we make everything shareable on WhatsApp. You know, you make it a PDF mm. that you can share on WhatsApp and that people can forward because we all know the power of forwarding. My dad, who's not really, who says he's a computer a little bit, not computer illiterate, <laughs> but he, he shares everything he does on WhatsApp, be it a meme, a GIF, or, or a, a picture. And so we know that our community really responds to WhatsApp messages and the viral messaging. So uh, it can be detrimental when it comes to you know misinformation but the same to in the same token it can be very awesome in spreading news uh, infographics have been a great way to get our message across a lot of the time it's just condensing the message to what's the most important to the smallest amount of words uh, just to make sure that people know you know what they need to know uh, like the enforcement guidelines Tanya you were mentioning that you saw my interview about trying to communicate to the public that we have citations we have the citation ability now that we can find people for violating our public health protocols how do you communicate that the best way is through a graphic a graphic that you post not only on facebook and instagram and twitter and that you can have like flashing on the tv when you're watching the news but also whatsapp and we've also had to learn how to debunk myths mistruths on whatsapp and that's why we had to make our own graphic you should have seen some of the crazy, some of the crazy viral messages that circulated uh, people, uh, about Guam going on lockdown, a helicopter to come over and spray us, uh, a lot of crazy things, National Guard. Also, another another platform we're really starting to to grasp and and use to our advantage is YouTube. We're all on YouTube. I love YouTube. The ability to use. Uh, our video messages that we're producing, you know, the governor going out doing something or her latest initiatives, you know, making that an ad on YouTube and boosting it. Boosting is amazing. So uh, the Leon Burrell administration during their campaign, they were heavy on boosting on YouTube and you couldn't watch your YouTube 
you can watch YouTube in peace during campaign season. And I think you guys see that too uh, nationwide, <laughs> but we, we really are, are capitalizing on that, you know, sending out these messaging about cancel COVID GU. I cancel COVID. I cancel COVID. I cancel COVID. I cancel COVID. I cancel this COVID. I cancel COVID. I cancel COVID-19. I would like to stop COVID-19. Yeah, I cancel or tell COVID-19. You know, the cancel culture usually has a negative tone to it, but we've adopted it and, and put the faces of our manamku, our older people. Because, you know, trying to build empathy during COVID is, is, is hard when people are losing jobs and people are, are hurting, they're, they're feeling isolated. So for the people of Guam, we really connect. We really feel passionately about our older people saying why they cancel COVID. I cancel COVID too, because I, oh. to, I want to go to mass. I want to have, you know, brunch with my family again. I want to do what I love to do. I don't want to see more people die. I survived a war, a world war. I'm not going to let COVID beat me. And then at the same, using that same campaign, we adopted it for younger people, for millennials and Gen Z. So it was a cancel COVID GU ad still, but then we put different faces and the faces of a lot of our influencers in the community and people who have been, uh, young people who have been impacted by COVID, whether they got COVID and they gave it to their dad, whether they're a new nurse dealing with COVID and being at someone's bedside as they're dying from the virus. And so Again, I can't stress enough the importance of effective, impactful messaging and messaging that works for your community. So what's that may not work for you, Tanya, or, or Dong, or Philippe? It may not work for you, but it definitely works <laughs> for Guam, especially, uh, you know, when we have people like our mayors. Our mayors are instrumental. They're our grassroots. They help us get that message across. So I know that if I send something to our mayor's chat, our mayor's group chat, they're going to spread it. And there's even more uh, mm. breaking even further down is that in our villages, we have the neighborhood watch chats, the village chats, and then they share our, our content. And so it's just a ripple effect and it shared, 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 shared. And so that's how you get the message across. I can tell you that my dad, who is almost 60, and my niece, who's 15, are getting the same message because somewhere or another, it's going to circulate in one of their group chats. And so that's been really <laughs> helpful. Don can speak to that. <laughs> Wow, that's impressive. That's amazing. I, I have heard about the um the coconut wireless. But I <laughs> coconut guess wireless, yes. I've never called it that. You know, Crystal's absolutely correct. And I think one of the testaments to her um performance and of course the governor is the ability for them to counter a lot of the fake news that was spreading and they were really good at you know addressing it as soon as it came out because she's correct there were so many crazy things that were going on especially on uh whatsapp right <laughs> and you know they came up to the front and said no this is fake you guys need to get your information from the chick or from public health and they're very good at that and i think it's a a very strong testament towards you know their professional abilities to be able to address all of the the fake news and also be able to produce good news um, proper news effectively and, and spread it. Thank you for that. Crystal, you were, um, you were actually in, uh, what, what were you doing prior to, to working for the governor? You were actually um, with KUAM News? Yes, so straight out of undergrad, I received my bachelor's in fine arts, music, and mass media communications. I got a call from KUAM News, one of our oldest broadcasting companies here on island, and they picked me up. They loved me. I did a camera test and, you know, it ended up being a perfect marriage of my passions, which is performing and writing and, and meeting new people. And so I was a news reporter for about eight years. My specialty was actually the cops in court. The, I, I really loved going right on the field to the scene of the crime and then following the case from the arrest to the, the criminal process or the judicial process. And then even like the sentencing, uh, I became really well known for my coverage of the clergy sex abuse lawsuits that broke a few years ago. And that was at the time of yeah. Facebook Live. So I've really always embraced new media. Facebook Live was a game changer at that time because not only could you watch a press conference, you know, not did, you didn't have to wait until 6 p.m. news or till tomorrow's paper to read the breaking news. I could bring you to the press conference with me. I think my, my work at, at KUAM though, you know, there's a lot of trust. I built a lot of trust with the community. You know, people let you into their homes every single night. 
right? And, you know, as a news reporter, we, we're very intimate with and people. People see me on the street and they feel like they know me. And so building that relationship mm. and that was really instrumental into bridging my transition to the, as press secretary of the, for the government. But at KUA News, I learned so much. I was able to, you know, really learn how to be resilient and, and to be, you know, okay with meeting really extreme deadlines and, and working and thinking on the spot, thinking on the fly. Um, also, I became really well known for one of the, uh, an active shooter situation. I was actually on the scene of a shooting and mm -hmm. rather than running away, I took my cell phone and press record and ran towards mm -hmm. the action with all the police officers. And what I did immediately after that was I WhatsApped it to my news director and I said, I'm breaking a story right now. And they put me on the news and, you know, it was, it was, it was scary. I like to tell kids this at all the career days I used to do is that we're all reporters now. We're all creating media, we're all creating content, you know, on our social medias, we're taking selfies saying, I'm at the beach or I'm with my family. We're all becoming storytellers. And so I just do that on a more professional level. And I think that I'm still a news reporter right now. I'm just on the opposite side. And now I'm telling the story of the government. And so it's, it's, it's definitely, I'm definitely on a different side of the camera and, and telling a different story, but I, I still see myself as a storyteller and, and a, a person who wants to build empathy and effectuate change through that empathy. Did you have to do any sort of adjustment sort of mentally to transition from being on that other side? You know, as a person who, who's really used to being on in front of the camera and performing, especially as a performer, you know, I, I, I transitioned well to doing interviews and, and meeting new people and answering questions and asking questions. But at the same time, I, I, I think, you know, part of me personally, it just, I take a, per, I take a beating whenever someone says, something not nice about our, our government, our perform, performance. And I think that's been the biggest struggle for me. At KUAM, when I was a reporter, I, could, I didn't have to take things personally because the stories weren't about me. I was just right. a storyteller. You know, now I'm an active character in the plot. And whenever I hear a hurtful message about the, the administration, especially on social media, especially in the comments or uh, if the live streams and people are, are saying, you know, hurtful things, I take it personally. And so sometimes at the end of the day, I just have to shake it off. I think that's been the really the biggest challenge for me moving from the storyteller to the, the person, you know, making uh, to, to being an active character in the story. Uh, yes. You know, I, at KUAM, yes. I didn't have to read the comments. Uh, I didn't, I, I only read comments to answer questions, but now it's, now it's, we're inundated with so much, you know, trolls and messaging. And there's even been, hurtful gifts and memes of the governor and hurtful stickers uh and you know trying to to not take those personally you know building uh, a callus for it has definitely been my biggest struggle in this position but you know I, i'm working yeah. on it you know it's it's sometimes you don't have to be liked it's okay to not be liked uh i i have to recognize that we're not gonna make everyone happy and how do you find the balance between you know, letting them open their doors and keeping our people safe because we all know what happens at a bar when we're drinking, we're under the influence, our decision making is, is, is changed, is, is not as, you know, as strong as we want it to be. And so I, I finding that balance, you know, being the voice, but also being able to take criticism and critiques and some of the hurtful messages, especially when so many are preconditioned to have mistrust in government. That's another battle I've been having to deal with is mistrust in government. Our administration, we recognize that trust is earned. Uh, our actions speak louder than words. And right. so we'll continue to work towards that, especially now as we approach year three of Leon Guerrero Tenor administration here on Guam. You talked about storytelling. I, I really liked that metaphor. Uh, it made me think of the title Maga Haga. Can you um, tell us a little bit more about that? So Maga Haga is the female version of Magalahi. So Magalahi is like the top chief culturally. So in Chamorro, he would be like the top person in the community. And so for our female governor, we had to change the verbiage to Mega Haga. And Haga, uh, Haga actually means in Chamorro blood, from the blood. And so Hagatnya, uh, Hagatnya is our capital city, also has uh, references the blood. And so female, our first female governor, very, very uh, historic for our people. 
uh, it's awesome too because historically people on Guam, our culture is, you know, we're female dominated. We're, we're, the female actually makes the decision. So it's, it's nice to have a woman in charge. I'm very excited to work for the first female governor. I still get excited every day when I wake up to, and I recognize that, wow, I'm, we're making history here on Guam, our first Magahaga. I know there's a lot of pressure for her. She wants to be the first, but not the last. And so setting that standard and setting the bar so that you know people like me, people like my niece, who I really want to make great impressions upon, know that they can grow up and change the world, even if they're a girl. And I think we're seeing that nationally too. We're seeing more women in Congress. We're seeing our vice president-elect uh, being a woman. You know, the future is Femalawan, which in Chamorro it would be the future is female. So it's it's the Chamorro adoption of that same slogan: the future is Femalawan. Now, are you the first female um, communications director? No, I am not the first female communications director, but I think I am, might be the youngest. Okay. I, I want to say I'm a rookie. I'm a rookie trying to figure it out. Like I, I told you, I came from the private sector for eight years, and then I made the transition to the public sector, and it was a, a culture shock. You know, a lot of things are different. Yeah. A lot of, uh, with government, things actually move a lot slower than I wish they would, you know, but these processes are in <laughs> place for checks and balances. And I totally respect that. I totally understand it. And I will comply with it. Well, I understand you were recently named uh, one of the 50 young emerging, oh, under 40 emerging leaders in government. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And when was that honor um, given to you? So just a few months ago, I got an email and basically said I'd been nominated for this really distinguished list of young adults in the government. And I was really shocked. I was, I was truly shocked because, again, I'm a rookie in government. This is my first year. They're considering only my first year of performance in the government. And I was really surprised. I'm a truly honored. You know, in the first year in our Leon Grouts in our administration, we definitely had some major struggle, struggles. Uh, we had the dengue outbreak. And if you know anything about dengue in Guam, we hadn't had dengue for 75 years. And so I want to wow. think that dengue, dealing with the dengue outbreak during rainy season, I mean, this dengue spread through mosquitoes, yes. and it being really the, the training, the practice, the practice for, for COVID-19 and how we managed emergencies, uh, we, it was truly a test of, of my communication skills and all the training I'd received in emergency management. And I think that's really where I shined was one, the, my, my first opportunity to shine in government was really with communications for our dengue outbreak. Uh, we were able to effectively communicate prevention and, and being part of that team, the communications team, I was truly honored. I think that's where I shined. And I think that's really what landed me on that distinguished list of top 50 under 40 and I know that list isn't annual so I'm really I'm really happy to be among some really awesome young talents uh, I, I turn the pages I'm like oh wow this person is so cool I don't even and I like that the, the list doesn't just go to the PIOs or the the spokespeople or the directors but you're seeing people who are one of the most impressive people on the list for me was the one of the interpreters at the judiciary because mm -hmm. he was transformative to how we provide uh, for th those in the, ju the justice system who don't speak English. Because sometimes translation, we get lost in translation and trying to communicate the very complicated judicial process, especially when you're not a lawyer, and to be a part of that. I was so impressed by him, and I'm really honored to be among a very talented group of young adults. And I hope that, you know, we continue to, to stay in government. I, I hope I continue to stay in government for as long as I can manage the stress level, but to make progress, because I think, you know, as we see the government employees, you know, retire, uh, we need more young talent to tap on to be, you know, the, the next leaders. Would you be interested in being a future Maga, Maga Haga? I get, uh, there's some jokes circulating about that among my friends that they think I'll be the next <laughs> governor of Guam, but I, I think that's too soon to say. I, again, I, I say that I'm rookie. I have a lot of uh, I don't have a lot of experience, but I'm always willing to learn and putting in the time. I love to to do good work. And I know that to, in order to do good work, you got to put in the time and the effort and you got to you know, endure the struggle. And so maybe in the future, uh, I haven't even been a, I mean, a lot of people would probably transition from senator from this position to senator and then maybe, maybe uh, go into to the executive branch. But 
Uh, right now, maybe not. <laughs> check me in 10 years. <laughs> check me in 10 years. Find out, call me up. Check me and ask we'll me, out. are you going to run for? So uh, again, I, 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 it's hard. It's hard. And yes, I, yes. When I know now, I now know why they call it public servant. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I've known Crystal for a long time since she was in media and you know, she's probably one of the best singers I know on Island also. And as you can tell from the interview, she has such a positive personality. I was really happy to see that, you know, her become the director of communications because that job is extremely stressful. But then in the governor's office, especially during COVID times, I can only imagine how difficult it is for this almost one year gauntlet um, that they've been going through. And, you know, they've been doing a yeah. good job at managing the messages. And, and it's just like she said, there are people out there that no matter what the government does, it's wrong. And they have to be able to, to take, you know, take those criticisms by, in stride and everything. And I, 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 I honestly think Crystal's doing a very good job with, especially the situation that she's been handed um, by far. It's, it's definitely nice to see someone young and you know she, she's underplaying the 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 40 under 40 because she's on the list with with senators she's on the list with two senators sitting senators right wow. now it's a very prominent list i believe um for for young people in government of guam to be able to make that list and you know she's on there i actually have another friend that's also on that list and it's very impressive and i love to see um people like that progress better. And I hope she does stay in government for a long time. Thanks, Don. I think that's uh, that's really awesome to hear from you, especially because he knows what it's like to be in my seat, again, in this <laughs> moment, so to be a part of the administration. But <laughs> I, I really enjoy it and the ability to change people's lives. I, you know, I, I really take my job seriously. I try to give all my time and effort. When a constituent calls, I take the call. And I try to listen and I try to figure out what is the problem and what is the solution or if I'm not able to help you, who can? And I think at the end of the day, yeah. it's about helping people. And I can tell you that I, I'm, I, I'm very touched by some of these stories. Again, it's not just me doing good work, but it's the governor. And I want to always put out the best image of our governor and our lieutenant governor because they are awesome people and they have really great hearts and they really want to do the best possible job for the people of Guam. And during COVID times, you know, added pressure, added stress, um, a lot of criticisms about yes. how they responded. But, you know, we, now we have our Strive for Five effort. Yes. And I want to take this opportunity to, to kind of explain what that is. So Strive for Five yes. is basically a goal. We recognize that we all want to get out of COVID. We all want to go back to normalcy. But how do we do that? Well, COVID is strong, is, 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 determined by our individual behaviors. We know that people are the spreaders of COVID. We know that our personal actions can have you know, serious consequences. And so Strive for Five is a call to action from our administration to the community to strive for five. Five is relative to a CAR score. CAR is short for COVID Area Risk Score. It's an assessment tool. Mm. It's a number, a singular number that people can look at and know if we're doing well or not. So it determines our risk the higher the number, the more at risk we are for not being able to manage our response. The, in our car score at 40, we saw that we had to put blue med tents outside our hospital. We had to call the, middle, the military for medics. We had to bring in nurses, traveling nurses, in order to cope with the overwhelming numbers in our hospital. The closer we are to five, mm -hmm. the more we were able to manage that response level. And now, as we are at five, we're starting to see the numbers decline. We're able to focus more on people in the hospital that are there for non-COVID things. People still have heart attacks, they still have strokes, they still have other diseases and need other surgeries. And we have very limited resources, most especially human resources. Today, we are at a CAR score of under four. We're doing well, but it's not just about mm. getting that CAR score of four or below five, it's about maintaining it. Especially with the holidays coming, we want to celebrate with more of our family and friends. So we're inclined to lift restrictions on the social gathering limit, which is currently limited to just five. And I know that Philippe uh, saw the governor at a conference, a virtual conference, and I think he might have a couple of questions. Conference. <laughs> I was able to see the governor at the virtual island summit. Um, oh, okay. And I saw that she was speaking a lot about the sustainability efforts on Guam especially in some um, new forms of asphalt, as well as um, trash reduction. 
Can you talk a little bit about the sustainability efforts that the governor's taking right now? Of course, you know, living on an island, you have limited space. And as you know, the world, I mean, less people want to take our trash. And most of our trash goes off island, try to ship, people won't take tires anymore. So we gotta get creative. We also have very limited space for our landfill. We closed our old dump, which became a, an environmental hazard uh, when it caught fire. And so we also have a new landfill, our Lazon landfill, but it's filling up quickly. So trying to change behavior again, much like COVID, trying to change people's behavior to recycle and to, and to reuse items is, is part of that effort. You know, we have senators who have spearheaded efforts for ban on plastic bags. We have supermarkets really embracing that mentality that what we have, we don't have forever. Nothing is forever including our, our island. And, and so it's really a multifaceted effort. You know, we have to protect our corals, our, our coral reef. Our coral reef protects us from tsunamis. You know, we live on Guam and we take advantage. We, we never really recognize the significance of the coral reef when it comes to disasters and emergencies. It protects us. And so protecting our coral reef, protecting our resources, is climate change is real and so I mean, we have a lot of different initiatives to to use you know glass in asphalt to um, to try to get more people to buy into uh, to trash collection you know trash collections when we started putting fees in trash for trash more people started illegal dumping and with illegal dumping there's some massive consequences especially when most of our island lives right on top of our northern aquifer you know, in Jigo, that's, Jigo is our most northern village, but mo most of our population is concentrated there. And if there's legal dumping there, they could contaminate our aquifer and our waterlands and then buy, buy like good drinking water. And then we're in an, another emergency. And so it's, it's definitely multifaceted as the world changes. And, you know, we recognize though that our efforts are just, you know, are very small. <laughs> our efforts are very small, but, you know, We'll, we'll do our best as, as we want to be a part of the bigger effort to protect our, our, our resources. So we have a, a lot of different initiatives. We have the Guam Green Growth Initiative, which is more than just um, more than just environment, but overall sustainability. And that's even feeding the hungry and helping the poor and ensuring people have adequate housing. But also we have um, the Island Beautification Task Force, because illegal dumping, I have to say, illegal dumping is one of our biggest struggles. Ever since uh, there, were, uh, there were costs associated with mm -hmm. trash collection, legal dumping is definitely uh, a hindrance. And we, it's, it sucks because we live in a paradise. And when you see trash, how does that make you feel? So part of the battle is instilling pride in, in our island. Again, we, we pride ourselves <clears throat> in being a tourist destination, but if we're covered in trash, it, it really, really dampens that. And we also know the consequences of putting tra uh, trash going into our ocean and pollution. And, uh, and then if we lose our, 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 our aquaculture, our, our, our sea, um, our, our fishes and uh, our coral reef, then we would you know, also hurt our tourism economy. So everything is affected. Everything is impacted. And, and if we take care of our island, it'll take care of us. Our office is working with the governor's office as well uh, on water resources and uh, drought mitigation. And also we just started discussion with the governor's office and the lieutenant, lieutenant governor's office on um, energy. Um, we brought in the Department of Energy and we're talking about um, solar, more, more, more renewable energy. And we, we actually spoke with the, the G3 initiative um, that Ms. Crystal was um, talking about earlier and, you know, Gulf Guam is definitely making a lot of strides um, into more sustainability, more renewable energy. It's a very, it's a very good sign for sure. How is your Guam's relationship with the federal government? I think we have a really great working relationship with our federal counterparts. I know that governor is on weekly calls with them, uh, lieutenant governor as well. You know, I think a testament to our, our, our relationship with the federal government is, is our war claims. Uh, earlier this year, we were able to pay out war claims with a very creative, out-of-the-box solution to a decades-old problem, and we, we worked closely with our federal counterparts to make this out-of-the-box idea come into reality and to execute it flawlessly and to pay out our war survivors uh, as quickly as possible because we know that they're not getting any younger. 
we know that they need this recognition, that they've been waiting too long. My grandma is one of them and she passed away without getting her war reparation. And so I think that uh, our, our, our relationship with the federal government is outstanding and we'll continue to maintain it. Governor Leon Guerrero has also you know, spoken to our Congressman, um, Mike Nicholas just recently, and then, you know, they promised to work together hand in hand as we, we all have the same goal, and that's to do good for the people of Guam. And so we can't do that without our federal counterparts, especially still being a U.S. territory. And I know that governor is very excited about our, our new president and vice president elect, and so are we as Democrats, uh, Democrat majority here uh, on Guam right now. In the conference I was talking about earlier, the governor was talking about this balance between the military and the Romanian population. Could you speak a little bit about how she forges that balance? That's a great question. Actually, Philippe, you reminded me that I wanted to bring up military buildup as one of our, our biggest challenges moving ahead and looking into the future beyond COVID. So military, it's always been a really, uh, really difficult balance. Uh, Governor Leon Guerrero has a very close relationship with Rear Admiral uh, John Minoni. They speak, I want to say, almost daily on the phone. They work very closely. They're, they're very open with each other. Um, they have a lot of honest communication about what needs to be done from either party. Uh, very symbi symbiotic relationship. And I think that that's, that's evidenced in a lot of what's happening around us. Uh, Governor Leon Guerrero was very, became very famous for her response when the Theodore Roosevelt, the USS Theodore Roosevelt needed help. Uh, the, we were able to house, uh, house these military members in our quarantine facilities. And they were able to get better, to get off a very vulnerable space that where they could have got COVID and more people could have been infected and possibly died. And so, you know, her opening Guam's doors to them, to letting them in, even though there was a lot of outcry, a lot of people against this, you know, in fear that they'd be part of the spread. Mm -hmm. uh, she, I think she, what she did was, uh, was, has really, really set the tone for how we'll continue to work in p close partnership with the federal government. So, you know, again, she speaks very uh, regularly with Rana Manoni, uh, you know, we recognize that our COVID response is also their COVID response. And so they've worked close in partnership, you know, to kind of mirror our guidance, to mirror our, if we're in a lockdown, they mirror it as well. They do their best too. Uh, again, though, we still need the, we still are very dependent on the military buildup. Uh, we're very close, but it's also finding that balance with our culture and our people and, you know, staying true to the, who the people of Guam are, but also balancing that, that we, you know, we are, we can't deny that we are strategic military location. We can't deny that. We can't deny how our proximity to China. And so we also need that security. So that exchange is, is, is so important. I think Governor Leon Guerrero is doing an excellent job at staying, uh, staying in close working relationship with our military partners. There's a movie out on Netflix <laughs> about, about Guam. Have you seen it? Operation Christmas Drop. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was so excited to to see that movie, to see it on Netflix. Uh, we actually just donated to the Christmas drop yesterday. Governor and Lieutenant Governor did a very brief, uh, very brief presentation with one of the coordinators for the donations. We donated like 80 tarps, canopy tarps, fishing supplies, tools, first aid kits. And these are, these are really high quality items that we're, we're sending off. And so I did watch it, very excited. I know there was, you know, some backlash from some people in the community who weren't very happy with how Guam was portrayed. But I think we need to remember that, you know, when we watch a movie, when we go to we seek out entertainment, that we are surrendering the, our, you know, what we know to be true. I mean, how many Netflix movies have I watched where a girl marries a prince? You know, we know that that's not a, of a prince of a fake European country. Uh, so, we, you know, I really enjoyed uh, the 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 opportunities he presented for the people of Guam was especially coming from the theater, uh, theater community here on Guam. A lot of my friends got to work on the lighting. They got to be extras in the background. They got to work on the set design and they even got to be, you know, background, uh, uh, they got to be extras. And so I think that was exciting. I think I watched it more so to find my friends. Uh, and to, they actually also featured Guam music on the soundtrack. So that was very exciting, a great opportunity for Guam. I know that some people weren't, weren't happy with the portrayal, but I think you gotta remember they weren't portraying the people of Guam. Uh, Operation Christmas Drop still is a, a real life. Uh, it's a real life 
a humanitarian training effort and and governor actually has been on the christmas drop herself and she'll tell you about mm -hmm. it and she'll tell you about you know people really do come out to the water and they're waving at you i think our biggest gripe though is that we don't have a mayor samson <laughs> i don't know who he's based off of but uh i liked i enjoyed the movie i enjoyed the movie the you don't have a mayor samson you do not have a mayor's essence, yeah. but, but I did like the exposure it brought for the people of Guam and for our island, and I think makes yeah. people curious. It makes people curious, and if people will go online and research Guam and Google Guam, that'd be great. I want to thank you today, Crystal, for the time that you have given us uh, to share a little bit about your work and some of the priorities uh, that that the governor's uh, putting forward. And wanted to ask if you had any last words before we go. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and please stay safe. Uh, a lot to look forward to in the new year. 2021 brings a lot of optimism and excitement, especially with the, the, uh, the, the new vaccine. So we're really hopeful that next year can be better and bigger. And I say bigger in the sense that we're able to truly embrace the ones we love. And so I just ask that everyone stay safe. Uh, too many of us have been affected by COVID-19 and we don't wanna see any more people pass from this, this virus that's very, very preventable. So please stay safe. Thank you for having me.